Hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast or bonus. I'm Donato Surbonas and I'm joined by my colleague, Orazio Kauki. Buongiorno, Orazio. Thank you, Donato. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, excited, you know, to make this our first new episode together and uh, we're ready to go. We're, we're going to talk about some transfer news, you know, the most uh, interesting topics out there. Okay, Orazio, let's talk about... Uh, more, uh, let's say, important stuff. It, Italy winning Euro 2020. Tell us how life in Italy, how life in, how the next morning in Italy looks like when you guys win the European Football Championship. Uh, I mean, it looks definitely exciting. Of course, last night was uh, was a bit crazy because of all the celebrations. Uh, uh, of course, there was a lot of uh, excitement because it was um, it was a very important game, and you know, especially winning uh, uh, against England at their own uh, in their own stadium at Wembley. You know, it was uh, it was pretty special. Also, because uh, we Italy haven't won uh, a European Championship in a long time, so uh, we wanted to to take that trophy back. And uh, I think it tastes even a little better because in the past few days, you know, the England fans and supporters, they were all convinced that they were bringing the trophy back. But in the end, it didn't happen. So, yeah, the, this morning, it still feels pretty good. Yeah, football is coming to Rome, uh, actually. And you said that it was a long time uh, since the last time you won something big in football. But come on, you should be, you know, uh, more sensitive to England fans. And what is funny that we actually have our basketball uh, greats like, for example, Sharuna Sisekaiochus, Danus Adamaitis. They all, uh, they are all uh, diehard England fans. Uh, how high your, uh, I mean, Italy greats like, I don't know, Milano players, Ettore Messina, you know, how high they are on football side. Uh, some of them they're pretty high, you know, because they are also big, uh, big football fans, and uh, there was uh, a lot of support coming also from the Italian national team in basketball. You know, the especially the two social media teams they exchanged a lot of uh, a lot of messages, a lot of uh, a lot of positive stuff. You know, heading to the finals. And, um, but yeah, also from some of the major teams in Italy, there was, uh, uh, there was huge support because at the end of the day, you know, football, uh, football in Italy is the main sport, you know, is the number one sport is the, is the biggest passion. And, uh, so even, you know, the guys that maybe are not so into it, uh, when, uh, an event like this is coming. Uh, they they become like real fans, so it was there was definitely a, a huge ex excitement around um, around all the basketball teams too. Okay, let's talk some basketball because it's not a football podcast, yeah. And probably we should introduce ourselves. You know, we both work for for a new basketball website, basketnews.com. Uh, and we are here on a podcast to discuss the most interesting and the most significant free agency stories uh, from the EuroLeague, EuroCup, FIBA Ch Champions League. And, you know, we're going to try to give you a better look uh, what's going on behind the scenes of these moves. And uh, we're going to try to share our opinions, uh, some inside information, uh, you know, uh, to tell you better story of what's going on. And our first topic... Uh, I would actually, I should need uh, to emphasize that the podcast is kind of informal way for us, you know, to tell about these stories. So there might be some trash talking, there might be some rumors, you know, which didn't make our articles because maybe it was lacking a few more confirmations. But because of, if, of the platform, we can talk like, you know, in the bar, the whole idea, you know, of this podcast, of all the podcasts I try to do, you know, it's like... Uh, connect basketball people and to you know feel more confident feel more uh, comfortable and to feel like we're talking the, in the bar but of course we've given you some some good information and for the first episode we're going to talk about two big things of this free, free agency uh first and foremost uh, partisan stuff partisan rebuilding and Jelko Bradovic comeback and also Vasilya Misic uh, extension the new contract with Anadolu FS 
So first of all, Jelko Bradovic coming back to Partizan from one to ten, how unexpected it was for you, Horacio? Uh, I would say at least eight because uh, when I was starting, uh, when I was started to hear the first rumors about uh, Coach Bradovic potentially return to to Partizan, I was I was really surprised because of course Partizan was coming from a very difficult season. Uh, they went through many changes and uh, they weren't exactly in the best uh, position uh, possible in, in this moment. So, you know, the, uh, the past few years, they've been difficult for them. Uh, aside from uh, the, la the year and a half uh, in which Coach Trinchieri was there and did uh, a pretty good job. And before the pandemic, it looked like they were you know, on the verge of returning to, to EuroLeague basketball because the Euro Cup season was going so well. But then, of course, uh, COVID hit and the season was suspended. And from that point on, uh, everything changed, you know, because uh, at the beginning of uh, the the coming season, uh, Coach Trinchieri left uh, and the technical situation, you know, it became uh, really difficult. The team uh, really struggled the season. So... Uh, when I started to hear the first things about uh, a potential return of Coach Obradovic, I was very surprised uh, uh, because um, in the previous months, I was hearing that it might have been uh, a possibility for Seska Moscow in, in the case of, uh, um, of Coach Itudis not resigning with the team and that also a couple of Spanish teams were following his situation. I believe it was mostly Valencia and uh, Hoventut. Uh, but then, you know, I, I think that um, he started to gain some steam, you know, uh, Coach Bradovic to Partizan. And I think it was also mainly to the fact that Partizan uh, hired... Uh, uh, Zoran Savic as their main decision guy in, in the front office and of course you know uh, a guy like Savic you know with all his experience uh, his pedigree his connection in the in the business because he has been also an agent for for several years uh, he really helped uh, in shaping the front office because that was another issue you know in partisan in the last few years there have been you know, some confusion inside the front office, not not all the people were looking in the same direction, you know, so it was a little bit difficult. So I started to actually believe that there was something going on, I think, at the beginning of May, because I started to hear some concrete stuff about Coach Obradovic being interested in, in, in taking the partisan job. And then I, I believe that I, I really felt that something was going on when I got the information and it was something that it came close to the agency that, that represents Coach Obradovic, that he, he was willing to return to Serbia, you know, that he, wa that he wanted to stay a little bit close to home after so many years, you know, outside of Serbia, in Greece, in Turkey, in Italy, in Spain, he wanted to stay close to home. And uh, there is no place like home for him, just, just like Partizan, you know, because his career started there uh, as a coach. Uh, his uh, legendary career started there. And uh, at the end of the day, everything came into reality. And uh, he has been probably the most interesting news in the European basketball this summer so far. Yeah, I was really surprised too. I didn't expect this move uh, because when you know when it takes Jelko Bradovic, there are two teams which always will be in the conversation: Panathinaikos and Partizan. And I didn't feel that Partizan was uh, healthy enough and well prepared enough for this big move because you know you have to provide big budget you have to provide solid front office and in recent years uh, before Zoran Savic uh, came to the front office uh, I was hearing not the best uh, feedback from people who worked in this uh, club 
And there were some, uh, you know, complaints about late payments, about the way how organization was working. And I felt that there is no chance that Jelko, you know, uh, will put his hands in the project, which has problems like that. And especially in the situation where he can choose the team because many great teams uh, wanted him. Uh, so it was really, really surprised. But, you know, um, now things are clearly changing uh, and Partizan, you know, reshaped their organization very quickly. As you said, Zoran Savic is, is one of the guys. He's really well connected. He had to deal with some tough contracts he had starting his job uh, the previous season. And of course, now there are a lot of speculations who helped uh, to bring uh, Jelko. I tried to talk with uh, people uh, in Serbia with my sources in Serbia, and the common answer is that we don't know what the hell is going on and, you know, what's helped, uh, you know, to bring Jelko back, what, you know, where all these money are coming from. Uh, and, you know, there are some speculations that probably the pre even the president of Serbia, Aleksandar Vucic, is involved in this, you know, in, in less or, you know, smaller or bigger role. Uh, but of course, uh, also, uh, Dusko Vujosevic in one of his interviews to Nova, I guess, he mentioned that, you know, uh, ev everybody who has, uh, you know, at least some common sense or anyone with a, with a little intelligence, uh, it's clear that, you know, it couldn't have, uh, it could not have been done without the interest of the state and specifically the president, uh, Vucic. So it's a very interesting situation because when it comes to politics, it's a very sensitive topic. Nobody wants to talk on a record. Uh, nobody knows the situation very, very clearly. And uh, one, one, let's say, smart guy told that it's probably the first time in modern partisan history when nobody knows uh, what the hell is going on, you know, uh, when what led to this success of bringing Jelko and building such a, a big project and co coming back to the president uh, side. Um, there are rumors coming from pretty reliable sources that uh, uh, Vucic was almost having a dinner with Jelko Bradovic every two days, you know, and he was uh, really high on trying to convince him to come back. Uh, some say that, you know, uh, basketball and sports is very big part of uh, Serbian politics, uh, you know, kind of, you know, creating a good and strong image of, of Serbia and Maybe it was kind of strategy, you know, of trying to put Serbian basketball on a map again. Uh, some say that maybe it was a way of, you know, buying some votes because as I, I understood, um, coach, uh, sorry, not coach, president, which is, uh, was not very likable by partisan fans. There were some insulting chants uh, over the partisan uh, arena from time to time and we are serbia is having elections the next year and maybe it was his way you know of uh, buying votes of that black and white part of uh, belgrade because sports uh, takes a huge role you know on, on the elections so a lot of speculations behind this and i know that there are people in serbia who are really concerned because if it's a government's project, uh, project they don't like how, what kind of big part in, uh, of, of this project the government takes. But for us, you know, when we are outside the Serbia, uh, for us looking from, first and foremost, we're basketball fans, looking for, from a basketball fan perspective, we're uh, watching a new, okay, we cannot call it new player, but we are watching big player um, emerging on a European basketball map. We're, we're watching legendary coach coming back to his home where it all started. We're watching all these huge signings and it's exciting. I mean, to have Partizan on the map uh, with all these signings with the coach is just a great for, for basketball fans. But I, I see, for example, I see Red Star, uh, Cervena Zvezda fans not agreeing with my opinion. I see some GMs not agreeing with my opinion, especially uh, these GMs who are trying to build on a, you know, on a fair play business model. And when we don't know where all these money are coming uh, from, of course, it's a thing which might trigger uh, some part of uh, basketball community. Uh, I think that uh, in some situation, you know, it might look 
unfair to some teams, especially to the ones, as you said, that always try to to play inside their budget. You know, they try to keep uh, um, a certain level of spending because they can go higher than that because the finances of the team uh, doesn't doesn't let them do it. Um, while with uh, while with some other teams, for example, like Partizan, but also like Red Star in the previous years, it looks like there is this situation always of ups and downs. You know, there are years in which they go out there on the market and they spend good money. You know, they invest uh, a lot of money in the roster. And then maybe the, the the following year, the situation is completely different. They have to cut down the budget a bit. Uh, they have to, they they need to let go of some players. So I can understand like that some GMs from other clubs, you know, they can be a little bit pissed about the situation because, again, when you look at Partizan in the previous season and what it's going to look like in this season it's going to be a completely different team, you know, uh, from from one day to another. Uh, they're going to be one of the top Euro Cup sides. Uh, they they made the huge reinforcements, uh, taking players from EuroLeague clubs, you know, Kevin Panther, Zach Liday, uh, taking a guy like Rodion Skouroks out of the NBA, uh, another very good player like uh, Alexa Abramovic, I think he, he can definitely be in a, in a Euroleague team, uh, and they are, and you know they are still very active on the market. You know, I expect them to make at least another of very good, uh, at least a couple of very good signings. So I can definitely understand why some people are mad uh, about the situation. Uh, but as you said, I I believe that is also very very important. You know, to have a, a team like Partizan, you know, with their history with their tradition to be back at the very high level, you know, especially in the EuroLeague market. I think that for, uh, for the people, for the people in EuroLeague having uh, teams like Partizan and Virtus Bologna at, uh, being back at the very highest level, it's huge because those are two huge markets, you know, uh, both Belgrade and Bologna because they represent the history. Of, of European basketball, uh, especially in the last 20 to 30 years. So uh, it's, it, it always depends on, on which side are you going to look like, because from a business point of view, for the EuroLeague, partisan Virtus back at this level is a great news. It's huge. But for other teams that they need to work with smaller budgets and they always try to follow all the rules and not going and they are not going to spend the extra money just because they can, um, it's different, you know, it's different. And it makes, it makes, it makes them a little, bit, a little bit mad because of this. And I understand, but it always depends on what what side are you looking on. It you know, it is it, always going to be. Yeah, yeah, and you know, when it takes politics, uh, also we have to uh, make clear uh, that uh, Jelko Bradovic was always the coach who was never politically involved in in any situation. And also, you know, when we share all these speculations, we should also wait for the answers coming from partisan front office, uh, because I believe that with some time and especially when we're going to finish, you know, building the team for the next season, probably we're going to hear uh, some stuff uh, and their reaction, you know, on what's going on and uh, about their situation. But yeah, the best thing is that they're making a, b a huge step uh, towards, you know, uh, the making the EuroLeague either by you know claiming for the wild card uh, after the season or just winning the euro cup uh, by itself and yeah in the end of the day i see uh, for sure i see more advantages of this growth sudden growth of partisan when disadvantages but okay if if it takes politics again if politics are involved the main concern is you know 
uh, what's the durability of this project because the next year we're going to have the elections in Serbia and how the project will change if, for example uh, another political power will, will come to the government or uh, another politic uh, from you know having different views will become a president uh, of of Serbia some basketball people uh, tried you know to to relax me uh, to relax me saying that since Jelko signed the contract for three years, that means that Partizan is safe for at least uh, three years. So yeah, let's uh, let's uh, keep uh, thinking that uh, it's gonna be you know good long term uh, budget and uh, best of luck uh, best of luck for Partizan uh, organization reaching their goals. Probably we should talk a bit about their current situation about get their current signings. Uh, if we talk about money. Uh, Again, these are unofficial numbers because for me personally, I didn't see official information uh, was the budget of uh, Partizan, but my sources say that it has to be something something from 12 to 15 million euros, and most of them uh, coming you know, for the salaries of the players. And we can obviously see that it might be true since Punter signed for two years, 2.5 million euro contract, something like that. Exactly, day uh, another contract which is close to one million. Radians Kuruts, I mean, his contract is should be also something around one million or or more. And we're talking about uh, big big money. And uh, what you're hearing about uh, some other potential signings or potential targets which uh, Partizan has on their radar. Yeah, uh, I think, you know, the, they are still very active. Uh, you know, the, the other day I reported about their uh, interest in the NBA free agent uh, big man, Ed Davis, um, which is one of the, I believe, one of the profiles that they are following for their front court. Um, you know, of course, an, an addition like this one will, will be huge because until until a few seasons ago, Ed Davis was considered a great backup option for uh, for a contender team in the NBA. So uh, being able to bring him to Europe, uh, of course, that will be huge uh, for Partizan. Uh, is one of the candidates, I believe, for that role. Um, there have been also rumors about the possibility of uh, Ekpe Yudo returning to, to Europe and, and to Partizan. Um, of course, he has already worked with, with Coach Obradovic, so there is that connection. They work together in, in, in Fenerbahce. Um, I, I think that there is a possibility because Yudo, of course, in the last few seasons, he has played in, in China mostly. But uh, as we know, uh, in the Chinese league this season, the situation is a little bit different because most likely they are going to start the season without foreign players. Uh, maybe there will be the possibility to have some of them coming mid-season, but at the beginning there should be no foreign players. So many players that maybe you know have spent uh, the last few years there, uh, they need to find now another solution, and most likely that solution is the is the European market. So Yudo can be another possibility. Uh, there were some talks also with uh, with Vlado Mitsov, uh, another guy who's coming out of uh, Olympia Milano. Uh, you know, he's a veteran, he's a player with a lot of experience. Uh, uh, he also confirmed that he has been talking with Partizan, uh, although he, he said that uh, it's only, you know, initial talks and there is nothing advanced uh, yet. But, uh, of course, that can be another uh, another possibility for for parties and especially for uh, for their uh, front court position. Uh, there have been also some rumors about uh, Bradley Wanamaker, but as far as I know, those are those don't look exactly concrete because you know, hearing from my sources, I know that there is interest for uh, for Wanamaker in Europe. Uh, but I don't think that uh, partisan, at least for the moment, is a is a concrete option for him. Yeah, one of the options I'm hearing uh, is Leo Westerman, former partisan uh, player. Uh, he is the ty that type of player which Jelko Bradovic likes. Uh, he he wants to have playmakers, uh, experienced playmakers on his team, 
And okay, Leo is a Frenchman, but uh, you know he might be considered as considered as a Serbian also because of his history with uh, Partizan, also with uh, his good friend uh, Geoffrey Laverne. The main thing is that uh, I heard that uh, Leo Westerman really wanted to stay in the EuroLeague for for the past few years, even though he didn't get you know many playing opportunities both in Fener or or Barcelona. But, you know, when it comes um, to the EuroLeague, if Vizelko Bradovic is calling you uh, and offering you a important role, a role and also ambitious project, which uh, Belgrade is uh, creating and building right now, I, I, you know, I wouldn't see Leo turning this offer down. Probably the main question is if Leo Westerman would be the main point guard, uh, what would he have, you know, next to him uh, on the court? But I would love, you know, to see him back because I believe it will help him to regain his confidence and re- to regain his stock. And what is interesting about Shelko is that I'm hearing that he would love. One thing what is interesting is that there are some concerns and you know, some critics saying that, oh, uh, part, it's not like the old, you know, old school partisan. They were about, you know, bringing a good core of young, talented Serbian players and then signing Two, okay, most uh, mostly uh, two or maximum three foreign guys who can help all these guys to grow and who could grow by themselves. And this time, you know, Jelko is just buying Euroleague final four, four players like, you know, uh, Lide and Kevin Punter. But the thing is that I'm hearing that Jelko really wants to buy, to sign Serbian uh, players, but not many good level Serbian players are uh, available on the market. And some of them, like Nikola Kalinic, he's linked to Barcelona right now. And Nemanja Bielica is another name which Partizan fans would be uh, great, uh, happy and glad to see him uh, in Serbia. He has uh, his contract expired with Miami Heat and there were some rumors that he might be heading to the EuroLeague. But it's not clear if, you know, it's these players are for partisan market, even for this partisan market. So uh, that's why Jelko has, you know, to look at some different options, which, you know, doesn't have Serbian passport uh, with themselves. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, I think, you know, that that is one of the reasons why, because, um, of course, uh, you, you will love to have uh, a certain uh, level of uh, of Serbia of Serbian players in the roster, uh, but as you said, there aren't many available, uh, especially if you're if you're considering like really young players that can develop and become in the the future of the team. Also, because I think in the especially in the last few years in in Serbia, uh, there's been uh, the growth of uh, of mega uh, of mega basket. And they've been very, very strong, you know, in attracting young players to them and let them grow, let them play and becoming potentially, you know, NBA prospects and EuroLeague prospects. Uh, So I think there is some ground that Partizan needs to recover from that perspective. Uh, So I think that is one of the main reasons why, you know, they are going after many uh, overseas and foreign players uh, because there are not exactly a lot of Serbian talents available and uh, the veteran swans are going to cost a lot of money too, you know, of course, because if you want to bring back uh, Bielica, for example, it's not going to come cheap, of course. Uh, So that's why they are going after also a lot of foreign players. They needed to change the plan uh, a little bit. And, um, and, and also because at the end of the day, it's clear that next season, you know, uh, in uh, 2022, they want to play in EuroLeague. And if you want to, to get that spot for the EuroLeague, you need to have a, a very strong roster because otherwise, you know, you, you're not going to, you're not going to reach the the final four in Euro Cup, and uh, I think you know from from that perspective, you also get the example of, of Virtus Bologna. You know, they in this past season they have built a very good roster, strong. They thought it was ideal, you know, to 
win the Euro Cup or at least get to the final and get the spot for the next Euro League, but it just didn't happen, you know. So, you know, there are so many different uh, factors and situation that can uh, come in. But of course, having the strongest roster possible is going to help you. So uh, they are going after very big time players because at the end of the day, they want the assurance that in the, in the next summer, they are going to play in EuroLeague. Yeah, and you mentioned that uh, money doesn't always, you know, buy titles, especially in the Euro Cup. We 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 should uh, uh, recall the Euro Cup draw and the new Euro Cup uh, format, which is, uh, if I would be, a, um, you know, a GM or the owner of such a big team like right now Partizan, like Virtus, like uh, Locomotive teams who are investing a lot of people, uh, a lot of money uh for 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 the season i wouldn't be glad because that knockout system is good for teams like let cabelis panevgis for example my hometown team but for for teams like partisan when you must invest so much money you know to reach that euroleague dream and your all all the dreams might you know end up with one bad day and one luckiest day of the season of of uh uh, teams like you know let cabelis i don't know hamburg towers or whatever it's it's probably not fair and I, I was a bit surprised I know that knockout system was always a good idea for basketball fans uh, because um, uh, we love when you know uh, all the stakes are for one game for 40 minute uh, match when e everything can happen but if your league is uh, thinking about the growth and you know adding huge uh, teams good markets uh, uh, strong financial situations uh, uh, probably they should, you know, make uh, some format which will be more uh, comfortable for, for bigger teams, you know, to avoid all these big surprises, at least to make home away games, uh, actually. And now, you know, everybody, everything might change uh, only after one game. I will just remind you that uh, Partizan has Andorra Morabank, uh, Lokomotiv, Joventut, uh, Letkabelis, Dolomite, Trento, uh, Metropolitans, Turk Telecom, Hamburg Towers, and Slask, Slask, Wroclaw teams uh, on their Group A, and of course they should be one of the top uh, teams on this group. But again, you know th this new format is exciting, but at the same time it's really <laughs> making huge risks for for teams who are spending. Yeah, exactly. You know, for for those teams, uh, it creates a lot of pressure because uh, what you have, as you said, you have one bad one bad day, and you you know you risk to waste the entire season, and uh, you know that that was the the feeling too. For example, for Virtus Bologna when they lost the series against uh, uh, Unix in the in the semifinals of this season. Uh, at the end of the day, they were able to get back on track and win in the, the league title. But of course, not getting the EuroLeague spot, it was a huge disappointment, you know, because they, they really believed that they, um, that they should have been in the EuroLeague the, this season. So, but, but still, uh, again, I mean, th this, this kind of format is exciting for the fans, but especially for the big teams, the teams that invest uh, a lot of money in the roster. It creates a lot of pressure because it basically you need one bad uh, game, one bad week, and you compromise everything. Okay, I understand. You know, Virtus being disappointed, but at least it was completely fair. I mean, it was serious of best of three, so it's probably the best what you can you know offer uh, in terms of finding the balance of some upsets and some you know, let's say. Uh, teams advancing to the next stage, uh, which are, you know, deserved uh, uh, to be in the finals, for example, because Unix had an amazing season and they played great basketball. So um, th that format was OK, but now it's going to be very intriguing. But probably let's jump to the EuroLeague. We have Anadolu FS topic to discuss. Uh, Vasily Amicic signing, uh, Anadolu FS signing Vasily Amicic to a three year extension. One plus one plus one. NBA out every year. It should be a very solid uh, deal because I heard that uh, CSKA Moscow uh, 
offered one, uh, 11 million euros, okay, with bonuses included for three years, but it's still, you know, huge uh, money. And it seems like, at least from what I've been told, that uh, Anadol FS matched the offer, increased the offer a bit. I don't know the official numbers. It, sh it shouldn't be something, you know, outrageous, you know, something from 15 million euros or, or like that. Probably it's just a bit uh, better than CSK's offer. But from what I've been told, uh, uh, Vasily Mitsch was really, really close to signing uh, with CSK. So uh, I, I'm actually happy about this deal with uh, FS because uh, first of all, of course, I'm mostly I'm happy because Mitsch stayed in the EuroLeague. That's the biggest win for the EuroLeague because we need such a big uh, time players uh, in in this side, you know, of Atlantic uh, Ocean. Uh, because we just, you know, um, too many great players went to the NBA and too many great players are waiting for the NBA opportunities, like Kevin Pangos not signing here in, in the EuroLeague. So we need, you know, to, to keep all these greats, uh, to keep the EuroLeague MVP. And the first and foremost, it's not just a huge win for, for the Anadolu Efes, you know, to making by making their situation safe and comfortable because you just... You, you can only imagine what kind of you know stress it would it would have made for the front office if Vasa left. But the next thing, of course, it's a big big win for the Euroleague, you know, to 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 save one of their biggest stars uh, here in Europe. Yeah, I think uh, of course this is the um, uh, is the biggest news first of all for Euroleague basketball because uh, keeping a guy like Micic. Uh, it's always a great news because at the end of the day, we're talking about the, the MVP of the past season, one of the best players uh, in Europe. So being able to retain him uh, in, especially, you know, in a period like this one where uh, many teams are uh, in, a, in a situation of crisis, you know, financially, uh, is it, a great news because there was this feeling that, uh, this was the summer that he was going to play in the NBA. So many, many believe that he was already gone. Uh, so being being able to keep him is, uh, first of all, is great news for Euroleague. Of course, it's a huge news for for FS because they didn't want they didn't want to lose him. Uh, um, they they were convinced that uh, with uh, some kind of of pressure. Uh, they would have been able to to keep him around. That, that's also why they basically never went for another target. You know, they explore some option. You know, they ask for some information. You know, because at the end of the day, you need to be ready in in the case he leaves. But they never really went for uh, for another guy. They ask some information about, for example, Wade Baldwin. Uh, they tried to understand what was going on with the situation of uh, Milos Teodosic, uh, but they, the, their first stop was always we are gonna we're gonna get back we're gonna get back Micic. So uh, for 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 them it was really a key factor, and uh, I believe that it was also very important, you know, the will of the player because as you said. There was this huge offer from from Seska Moscow. Uh, it was a, a very good offer, financially speaking. Uh, but in the end, he decided to stay in Istanbul because he has been there for several years now. Uh, it feels good there. Uh, of course, Istanbul is a beautiful city. Uh, when it comes to the financial side, you know, there is also the fact that. Probably, you know, living in Turkey is, is cheaper than living in, in other country also because the, you know, the value of the Turkish Lira compared to Euro and dollars is pretty low. So the, the cost of life is lower. Uh, I believe there is also less taxation for the high salaries, you know, for the, uh, uh, for huge money. So, uh, this was uh, really a, a key move for for FS, and you know, at the uh, at the same time, um, it gives Micic some kind of flexibility because, uh, as you said, it's a three-year contract, 
but there is a, an option to get out of the deal basically every summer. So for example, if next summer, something really, really interesting comes from the NBA and he wants to go, he can use that option, you know, pay what he needs to pay and go to the NBA. So I think at the end of the day, it's a win-win for, for both sides because uh, FS keep uh, their key player and uh, Micic, you know, remains in EuroLeague, uh, remains uh, a key player with uh, a huge salary. And uh, again, at the end of the day, it's a win-win for, uh, for every side involved. Yeah, in Europe, it was either CSKA or Anadolu FS. Um, but what was funny is to, you know, watch how European basketball fans were sure that Mitsich is going to the NBA. They were just, you know, choosing teams, uh, picking teams for, for Vasa, what would be the best destination for him. But the, the main thing is that uh, all the qualities which Istanbul and Anadolu FS uh, can offer was ready, you know, was, um, was always in uh, Vasilya's mind. He was always, uh, you know, feeling very appreciative of the situation he was, uh, not only, you know, having a good, comfortable life in Istanbul, but also having a great role in, in FS, having full trust and full support from the head coach, having the team in his hands and competing, you know, for the EuroLeague title uh, year after year. And uh, he was, Vasily Misic is actually very, let's say, um, easygoing and uh, I would say relaxed person. He enjoys the moment. He doesn't overthink uh, of all the potential uh, situations. And as I said, he always enjoyed what he had in, in FS. And, and, and I think that he also mentioned in, in some interviews. Uh, but as I know, uh, some, some, uh, for some, somebody, for people uh, outside, for example, if, if you look from Real Madrid perspective, if you look for, from CSK perspective, uh, it was always hard for them to understand how happy Mitic is actually in Anadolu FS. Uh, but regarding to the NBA topic, um, there weren't uh, many options, actually. The, the first thing is that OKC, OKC was interested in bringing him uh, to the NBA. The other team which uh, was uh, interested and high on Misic was Chicago Bulls, uh, thinking about uh, drafting for his uh, rights. Uh, but um, as you said, you know, Vasilye is um, keeping all the... Um, tools in his pocket of you know making the best decision uh, when he needs to uh, with all these NDA outs and of course he's a smart guy and he's smart enough to understand that situation in OKC with all these guards is really tricky and he didn't want to you know switch that comfortable situation to unclear NBA situation uh, especially especially when he wants and not just to make the NBA, he knows that he he can't play in the NBA, but he wants to play a bigger role, and and you know and to run the team. And first and foremost, in the NBA, you never know what can happen with you, and especially when we consider such a, at least for now, unstable situation like Oklahoma City Thunder can offer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, that's uh, that's also one of the points. You know, in the NBA, you. You are never fully in control, especially when you're when you're not like the superstar of the team. But even in that situation, you know, a, a trade might might arrive when you when you don't expect it. So uh, there is that level of uncertainty that certain players, you know, they just don't like that that kind of stuff. You know, uh, as you said, you know, his his NBA rights are owned by the Oklahoma City Thunder. And Oklahoma right now is uh, is in a very specific situation because they are rebuilding. Uh, they have uh, so many draft picks for uh, for the coming years, and you know they are going to take every possibility to get maybe one superstar to come there or to ac absorb big contracts from other team to get more draft picks. Uh, just like they did, uh, for example, with, with Boston, with Kemba Walker, you know, and maybe Kemba Walker is not going to stay there for long, but for the moment he's there. And then you have Shai Gilgis-Alexander, you have Teo Maledon, 
you know, already in the point guard position, there is uh, a lot of players. And so for, uh, for Micic, you know, to come in that environment with no guarantees about his role, you know, what, what kind of role he's going to have, it was difficult, I believe, to accept that kind of situation. And uh, yeah, there was interest from, from other teams. Uh, as you said, there, there was the Chicago Bulls mainly. Uh, they have uh, Arturas Karnishovas uh, as their main front office guy. And of course, Karnishovas knows the European market very, very well. And they really like Micic. But I, I, I just think that as of right now, it wasn't possible to make a move, to make a trade for his rights. Maybe because, you know, the uh, OKC asking price right now is too high, maybe. Uh, the situation might change during the, during the season. We will see. But again, there was probably too much uncertainty around his potential role in, in the NBA. Uh, while Micic, you know, he wanted more stability. He wanted more security, more guarantees and he probably is going to have more more of those in in FS than in the NBA right now. Uh, then, of course, with the with the contract that he signed next summer, the situation might change, you know, because he might receive an NBA offer with a clear plan, you know, with a clear role. You're going to be like the backup, and uh, you know what kind of minutes you are going to take, and the situation might change, and he will be able to get out of the deal, but. I think that for this summer, as you said, FS was probably the best option for him, uh, even if uh, even if Steska Moscow was also there, because FS is uh, is an environment that he knows really well. The fans love him, the coach loves him, and uh, he has already won there, and uh, he wants to continue to to win there. So again, this was probably the best solution for him. Yeah, and well-deserved GM of the Year award for Alper Yilmaz of Anadolu FS. Not only Vasily Misic, but also Rodrigue Babois, uh, also Adrian Mormon staying, and this team will be able to compete for the championship uh, again, for sure. And the only um, only missing player will be Sertac Shanli, who made an incredible jump uh, during this season. And he, you know, he surprisingly... Uh, moved uh, to Barcelona. Uh, a lot of people were really surprised by this move. Even uh, me by myself. You know, when I broke the news about him, about him, uh, you know, being in advanced negotiations uh, and being between Barca and Andalus FS, I was also so surprised that uh, I, I re-asked my sources few few times if we are really talking about Sertac Lee going to Barcelona, but. That's just the way Sharuna Sesikaj is selecting his players because he see, you know, he see basketball in a different eyes and he wants uh, specific players for some specific roles. Uh, but when uh, when we are hearing that Anadol FS is uh, negotiate in negotiations with Jock Landil, uh, I'm I'm thinking that you know Alper Alper Yilmaz and of course Ergin Ataman, who is mostly probably uh, responsible for building this team. Uh, are looking for a best uh, possible replacement uh, because if they will manage to sign Jack Landale, it would be great, great uh, decision. Uh, he already made a great rookie season with Jargris. It was tough in the beginning, but late later he showed his potential. I think he made a let's say a mistake uh, of you know um, moving away uh, from from Jalgiris because he was sure that he's gonna have the NBA deal but it didn't work out and he spent the last season in in Melbourne United he won the, the Australian championship uh, but still I think that his place in the is in the Euroleague and the thing is that now he still thinks about the NBA but there's a big possibility that Anadolu FS and Jock Landale will agree of you know putting the NBA out and his contract for this uh, August. And the deal is really, uh, really possible. And if it will happen, it will be, again, uh, it would be an ever, another great move uh, by the front office of Anadol FS. Yeah, I agree. You know, when when you are able to replace a guy like Sunley with uh, with a player like uh, like Joe, is, uh, it's fantastic because... Uh, 
is a very good player. As you said, it was surprising a little bit to, to see him in Australia because he is a player that that definitely belongs to the EuroLeague and he might belong to the NBA even. And uh, yeah, I, I believe that the main obstacle there could be, again, the NBA option because he, he would really love to, to play in the NBA. But of course, he has to understand what, what kind of situation uh, he might get. You know, from, from FS, again, in this situation, there is a lot of, of stability because he knows what he can get there. Uh, he knows the the amount of money that he can get and the type of role that he's going to play with the team. Uh, in the NBA, is going to be at best a rotation guy. So, uh, it, it, of course, the, we're talking about two very different things. Uh, regarding to to Shanley, I was uh, I was a little bit surprised too when I when I first heard about it. Uh, but then, you know, asking to a few people, it was actually uh, a personal request from from Sarvana Siasikovicius, you know, because he really likes the, the profile of the player and uh, he really wanted him to be their, uh, their reinforce for, for the front court position. And it was also a little bit surprising because there were so many rumors, you know, around the potential candidates for for the big man spot in, in Barcelona, so many different names linked to, to the team. But in the end, they went with, uh, let's say, a surprising move because uh, Shanley wasn't one of the guys that they were mentioned uh, close, to, close to Barcelona. But again, it was a personal request for, from, uh, from Jessica Vicius. Uh, uh, Barcelona has already a very loaded roster. You know, they can rotate the guys a little bit. And uh, it will be interesting to, to see him there in Barcelona because for Sally, this will be the first experience in his career outside of Turkey because so far he has always played in Turkey. So this will, will represent something completely new to him. Uh, but I believe that the chance that he that he got from from Barcelona was too good to to turn down, you know. Yeah. So probably this is it, right? I, again, uh, we took it longer than expected, and I said for the first time. I said this for the first time because it's our second take actually of this pod because we had some audio issues, and me personally, I thought that we're gonna make you know much shorter part because we already discussed a lot of things uh, pretty in depth you know before but now i see that probably took again one hour so damn it's <laughs> it's it's funny how long we can talk about basketball and we took only two teams actually yes uh, i mean uh, at the end of the day when you when you do something that you that you really love uh, you can uh, uh, lose a bit, uh, lose a bit the 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 amount of time that you're spending about it. Uh, so, but it was good. Uh, again, uh, it's at the end of the day, it's a free flow conversation. So sometimes uh, we we just got lost a little bit into it, and we try to add, you know, even more more details to to the conversation because we we jump also on. Uh, other things that uh, maybe weren't planned at the beginning, uh, but it's also pretty good. And uh, I, I think that it's also enjoyable, you know, to the people that, uh, that listen to us because uh, uh, I, I believe it's a, it's a better format in this way because you have much more freedom and it's not too schematic, you know. Yeah, and, and in the future episodes, we're going to talk about the other teams, for example, what is going on between Barcelona and Real Madrid, also changes in Milan, uh, our teams. We might involve agents from time to time, you know, to speak about some interesting uh, free agency situations like uh, what's going on with China. Uh, at the same time, you know, what's going on with the, for example, point guard market, why this actually, why this FS move was so significant that in this narrow point guard market, uh, they would have a lot of problems if, if Mitic uh, was gone for the NBA, for example. So gonna, we're going to, I believe that we're going to be better and then better uh, every episode. Uh, we will try to 
make uh, one at least one episode uh, per week uh during the summer during the season uh who knows uh we will try you know to react to some specific situations but yeah again i, I hope you guys you you liked our conversation uh you can uh, leave your feedback on a comment section i expect some kind of shit storm uh, from maybe partisan fans maybe zervena zvezda fans uh Fenerbahce people are usually active so I'm I'm kind of prepared for everything yeah I mean we we cannot uh, make a prediction about the reactions but uh, yeah th- there will definitely be some some talks uh of course it was uh it was good to do this for for the first time and uh, I just suggest you know to all the people that listen to us to keep following us because of course in the coming weeks we will have uh, we will have uh, more stuff and i think that also you know getting closer to the start of the uh, nba market you know with the nba free agency too there might be some even more interesting topics to to talk about it and again as uh, as you mentioned and also the possibility of having some guests so keep following us and uh, keep also looking at, the, at our brand new project basketnews.com which is trying to provide you guys with uh, very good uh, and interesting uh, content so we'll see you next time yeah uh, don't forget to follow us on our youtube channel basket news where you're going to find our podcasts our segments of uh, urbanus podcast and also Uh, some other for example nice content like video analysis of our colleague Augustas uh, Shulauskas thank, thanks again Horatio thanks uh, thank you listeners and viewers uh, and see you soon goodbye